and now I'm doing it. And it's like, well, now I'm doing the hard work. And it's like, woohoo, I might get to become one of the greatest in the game. But I'm learning, you know, by like listening to podcasts of people in their, their 40s who are the ones succeeding. It's like, it's a hard fucking work day. You got to like write a bunch of books and do a bunch of podcasts and go found nonprofits and be on the board and go hire people and fundraise. It's like, Jesus fucking wait, Christ. Well, like, wait, what are you talking about? You're talking about uh, the, the job that you want to do? Is that like, who are you looking up to exactly? Or yeah. What, what podcast are you talking about? That, that example was this guy um, who... Because I don't believe that you, as, as someone, someone uh, speaking as somebody in my 40s or at 40, I, I don't believe mm-hmm. you have to do all those things. Yeah. <laughs> don't, yeah. Not to be successful, not to do what you want to do. No. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it's like, I guess the question is like, well, what, what do you want to do? Right. Like in a, like, like in a sense, I've, um, let's start I've, there. What do you yeah. want to do? Yeah. God. I mean, That's I, a good question. It is. I mean, I mean, it's the best, I mean, it's the nexus of all questions. It's the mother of all questions. And then I think it gets to the, the unanswerability of it and like the aqueousness of it. Um, but yeah, what do I want to do? Um, because I'm, I think that question is the, if you can answer that question, you have figured out your identity. And I don't think anybody can actually <laughs> answer that question. I don't know if anybody can figure out that identity. I think maybe that's one of those things where it's just the journey. Well, the journey. yeah. And I think it's one of those slippery things that as soon as you get it, like you'll wake up tomorrow and it's something else. Yeah like sleep like uh as soon as you as soon as you can get enough yeah. sleep, you don't really want it anymore huh interesting we oh, it's, that's my experience let's let's talk about sleep next so okay. <laughs> so we'll talk about what i want to do and then i want to give you a chance to to riff and explore on, on that and then we can talk about sleep which i think you know gets into health certainly when i think about kids and what i might want to do um I've been thinking a lot about kids and where that would fit. Um, Me too. Yeah. Um, but what I want to do, you know, I, I guess I want to follow my obsessions unimpeded and have an audience who likes what I do who likes following the journey of me following my obsessions kind of sentence to sentence, moment to moment, minute to minute over the course of my career as a writer and a thinker and an artist. Um, And that they support me in doing that. So I don't need to quote unquote, have a job. Um, And that that is the job. My, my job is to watch my mind and stoke the fire. And, you know, I mean, I guess what I want to do is to communicate that better, right? Do a better job of letting people into my passion, my obsession, my, what the author Maggie Nelson calls my organized web of obsessions. Because it's a very organized web. You know, I, I've shown you many little bits of it. And I've kind of thrown you little spider web pieces of it. And it's like, little fragments. Um, so what, what you what you've just described sounds like the kind of goal of any artist. But let me ask you this, how important is the audience? Like, do you need an audience <laughs> to, to be to be stoked on what you're doing, like, to do what you want to do? Or could you just do it without an audience? Yeah, that's a great, that's another great, great question. Um, because it, it, it sort of forces you to, to ask what what the audience is right i i do fine hmm. i think i need correspondents like people like you like i feel like what you and i have and i think you know what it I would you know i do need feedback that's yeah right. yeah like like i need like i i keep a space for probably 15 to 25 individuals in my mind and in my flow at any time. And I'm constantly like dishing them stuff. 
Um, and I'm not needy for immediate feedback. It could come, you know, a day later, a week later even. But I do need feedback during the day. And, 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 that, and that there are people, when I say on my team, I mean less that, you know, they're employed and I'm paying them a salary and we you know we have the G suite and we have our project management software and we're going towards this goal. But in your in your support group or network, sort of. Right. Okay. And I mean yeah. And we're it's both, like we're both in the Bay Area, so th those are th that's some jargon that we ha <laughs> that we throw around huh. occasionally. But G yeah. suite and project management. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, for me, it's like, it's very, I'll say technical in that it's like, I have my Apple messages pulled up and I have m many long conversations in there and I'm kind of constantly swimming in my correspondence and like, kind of like feeling around for the next thing to say to the next person or to write in the next Place. What is your what is your main uh what your main output as an artist right now? Is it your newsletter or is it is it your Twitter feed or your, what is it? Yeah, it's a good question. Um I would say it's it's my my posts on um there's kind of four platforms that are all different, but all the same. You can kind of say. Um, if, between... if I was gonna, if I was gonna help promote what you do, and I said, tell my friend, you should check out Jeff Geis. He's really great. You should read his blank. Yeah. Um, you should. You should check out his obsessions. They're really cool. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's a, and like it always changes with like what I would show a person, which is. This right here is my failure. This is my financial failure and my artistic failure and my professional failure right here, where rather than be effective at knowing what my brand is and my product is and promoting it and having a very clear answer that rolls off the tongue, instead, I want to have a, a unique relationship with you and think all over again about, well, what are the two things I'd like you to read that I think are, are right for you. And that's where I fail because an author, if you're successful, you need to have your book and you need to talk it and you need to know exactly what to say. And you say, go by the, go by the book. It's what it's about. And it's like, I'll have written it already, but I'm in the stupid childish idiotic position of being stuck, always starting over at the beginning, every minute of my life which is why i write many posts about being out of money and wondering to myself why it is so and why nobody sees what i see and wants to honor it and support it um because yeah it's me trapped in a wheel starting over at the beginning every time because that's what my work is it, it's it's a constant coming back to consciousness and presence and identity in the world, in you know, the United States in 2020, this particular moment. Looking at the computer, listening to yourself, thinking, what do I do next? What's my job? Yeah, well, yeah, what, what you're kind of describing to, to me is something that every artist is familiar with. And some artists are able to commodify what they do in a way that other people can recognize and understand and give them money for. And in, in essence, we don't really do that. We don't, we don't, we like our natural state of being is not to package what we do and say, this is it. I mean, we, we do that out of necessity. We don't want to. I'm, I'm a music composer, but I don't, I don't, I, the only reason I say that is because it's easy for people to understand, you know, I'm actually really a sound artist. Well, actually I'm just an artist. I, my, I just, hmm. my paintbrushes are, you know, sound effects basically, or just sounds that I put together. That's just what I happen to use 
but one day I'll probably use finger paints and it'll be mm-hmm. the same thing. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but like having to, you know, it's like, it's like that article that you, you, you pointed at the other day, mm-hmm. which, which, which article, the, the, uh, the uh, death of the artist and the birth of the creative yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah. Every single, well, I don't, I mean, I think every artist has, every successful artist has to think of themselves as an entrepreneur. I think it's always been like that throughout history, but especially in the 21st century, um, when middlemen are being disrupted left and right, right. And, and artists can't, they, you can't make ends meet. You can be an artist as a hobby if you can if you can uh, support yourself um, doing it. But no, you really got to think of yourself as the, a businessman in some respect. Yeah, and that's so disgusting. Of course, we don't really like that. I mean, to me, it's not disgusting. I mean, ha- half of my brain is that. You know, my father's an attorney, and I mean, he and I disagree on philosophies of life i think now i'm i'm kind of like you know died in the wool of work hard in school do everything right um and you know and also like you know going in to corporate america and you know having a couple of careers here and there and marketing and recruiting you know i i love perfection and i i love um really good execution and it's all a matter of spending the brain cycles and the attention right. You know, I mean, like any job, um, you can break up into discrete parts and essentially like write the script for how to perfectly execute that job. Now, I sort of love doing that. And if you look at my day, it's very much like that. Um, now, I also love disobeying, and I don't really disobey the structure of my day, but I let myself get sidetracked and go away from what I thought I was going to do. And it's like, that's what I leave time for, right? My, my job is to get lost. My, my job is to go where it feels right, follow my intuition. Well, do you, in order to do that, do you feel like you have to have a manager help you do that? Or do you have to be the manager that helps you do that too? And how do you separate those two things? So there's this ideal creative partner that I need and, and probably won't get. And I feel like I, I will be trapped in, in this world forever where I'm, I'm constantly waking up and am screwed and can't get out. Well, why would you say that? You don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I, pessimistic. Yeah, I mean, I'm. You know, it it would be it would be so great to have someone else who is. So an editor, they're not in love with your work but they do want the best for you and your work. And I think I very badly need that person to show up um, because I have a lot of output. Clearly I'm, I'm committed. Um, And yeah, it, it just takes somebody who's not me, who's looking at what, what I do can, can become. And I, I I will never be that best person for myself. Much like it's hard to it is hard to edit yourself. That is hard to do. I mean, it's not that it's hard to do. Um, I I think it's it's very hard for me to do. I mean, I I, I'd rather not do it, and I I probably don't do it very well. Hmm. Or, or when I know that I'm going to have to edit m- my own work, then I work in a different way. Hmm. And well, yeah, yeah. Then it's like, well, you need like before you lay stuff down, you know. And, and I mean, I'm sure this is the same with composing music as it is with you know writing code. It's very easy to you know put your head down and sprint and do what feels good. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, well, okay, now I need to like re look at this work and see Ugh. if it really fits 
And like, yeah. I need to be like, I need to be the audience now. I need to be its reader. Now I need to forget that I'm also the composer. I need to be very harsh on this thing because I know, you know, I could listen to Beethoven, Bach. I mean, I could go down the list. It's like, well, why should I listen to your thing? The, the bar is so high to be worth someone's time. That's, that's, the, that's probably the impossible game that I kind of like rage against is like, there's no way, even me at my best, it's not good enough. Oh, man, that's a poisonous thought, though. Because there's a lot of people in the world that are looking for content. Hey, hate to use the word. That. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that there are. I think that's the the dream. That's what we've been told. Hmm. I think the amount of content. There's so much bad podcast. There's so much bad podcast. So much <laughs> bad medium posts. So much bad music. There's so much bad stuff. And, I'm and, grateful that there's a lot of bad stuff out there. I I don't know. It's I don't I don't uh, I, I don't wish I'm, that there was less of it. Sure. No, and I mean, I, I mean, I think I've, I've, I've learned by, you know, making stuff every day for seven years, 10 years. I know how much this stuff piles up. Now, I think there's a big difference. I think the most interesting kind of thing in being an artist is the difference between the noun and the verb and like the, the process and the product. It is absolutely essential for me to work five hours a day. Absolutely, like I, I have to do it. Now, what is, what is the verb of artist? Art, arting, art. R well, I mean, I guess f for the verb of of artist. Well, it's funny. I I saw a a painter working today in Golden Gate Park, and I sat and watched him for three minutes. Um. I mean, I think the verb... He got of, your time. Yeah. I think the verb of arting is, is just being locked on your subject and your medium and your tools. Yeah. No, it's, it's being in the zone. It's arting. That's what it is. Yeah. I don't know why people don't say that word more often. I think, I think as, as it becomes more uh, clear what an artist's role in the 21st century is, <laughs> arting arting should become a, a word that people use all the time yeah because like you're that. gonna you if you work at a company you're gonna need an artist you're gonna need a designer but the designer isn't just an artist oh He's yeah a coder, so a designer has to do some arting every once in a while well have i have i sent you that tweet that says that um art asks questions and design answers them and uh, that, that's a good way of putting it and that you really need to lean in to whichever you are a lot of designers like to think they're artists Mm -hmm. um and vice versa um but it's like you're really either truly a creator or an editor hmm, okay it's su i mean to me it's such like a violent and offensive tweet just because yeah. i know that i wouldn't want to be on the side of you know knowing i have a spark of original creativity and soul to, to give but like not having the guts and like kind of like yielding the floor to somebody else who's got the guts I guess so. Uh, to me, it's just there's so much overlap there. It's the it's hard to draw a line. Yeah. Well, yeah, because if you are, I would say, capital A artists, it's like you have to be both people. You have to be the completely maniacal creative personality that will not be denied and that will take up the whole space with his whole soul and every ex-girlfriend every screaming at your father every teardrop every emotion you've ever had every trauma is all in you whenever you sit with your pen and say the next thing it's all there and it's a very primal scream that you're giving and you're you're anchoring back to the big bang you you are all that is man yeah. So you have to so the next second. Yeah. So you have to be both that character and 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 know that that's one voice, and then you need to be your whole objective taste, and that you follow who you follow on Twitter. You are reading the stuff you're reading. You've 
you're a very disciplined reader, careful what you listen to, and only the very best stuff gets through. And you also need to evaluate the whole world and see yourself in it, right? Like, and you also need to know how, how good or not you are, right? I mean, a lot of times, like, I'll, I'll pour out my heart and soul in a post. I'll push post randomly in, like, 10 minutes later, I'll check my email and I'll see, oh, Patreon post from Jeff Lewis. Oh, God. Oh, oh that sounds noisy and stupid and yeah. oh, gross. Right. Well, of course, that's, that's, that's everybody who makes things. But I also like Jeff Lewis's work. Sometimes I really like what I do. And there's nothing better than really liking what you do. Um, now, I can tolerate that moment. And I can archive it and throw it away. And, you know, I mean, I'm glad I get to talk, to talk about it with you now. But it's like, like, like I'm, I'm, almost, I'm also not going to go, like, cry to my therapist about my work not being good enough. It's, like, part of the job, right? I give myself some grace. I'm still a young artist. I've only been doing this full time for two years. I haven't found my way yet. I'm still a beginner. I'm, I'm, I'm 33. You know, many people don't do good works until they're... Hell, I mean, you know, I mean, again, there's like no, there's like no number on it. Yeah. You know? No, there's no, there's no number. Um, you, there better not be a number. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of designers or editors or whatever, whatever you'd call that, 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 uh, that job. Um, I think that a lot of, artists kind of flip between the two or move in phases. I know for me, as my work became more formulaic, I became a designer, I became a music designer. And because I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, I was being hired to, I was being commissioned to write music, but I wasn't pulling it from those parts of my soul that I pulled all the art from, you know, mm -hmm. every, single, mm -hmm. every single tear and ex-girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Like instead that wasn't efficient for me really. And I knew that I could, I knew that I could create something that, that, that my audience would be happy with that. I, they would be proud of and I could get away with it and then they would pay me and that was great and it would feel good. And I'd be proud of what I did, mm. but it wasn't really art for me. Mm. It, the, or the art was a different, the art, the art of it was different. The art was how I put it together or, the art was how quickly I was yeah that. it well, wasn't it wasn't that emotional zone and and mm -hmm. that that can last for and that lasted for years until i was like actually this is getting pretty dull i need to do something that is really you know actually reaching deep into my mm. my gut and pulling out something that i am afraid to show the world and that's a, mm -hmm. a different topic is all the things that we're mm. to express ourselves but well yeah and it's like that's i mean i i live right there i mean i yeah i mean like the stuff i i posted and and sent today um and i i owe you one more explanation um but yeah i mean it's like writing from the ver from right where i hurt and it's like i think that to me, at least, has become the the thing to do. If I'm going to share, if I'm going to open a vein and share where I'm at with my audience. Do like, you think what you create, you could do as commissioned work? Um, it's a great question. Um, I don't. I don't think so. And actually that could be a huge breakthrough for me because it's like, I don't, th I mean, yeah, it's like the urge. See, this is super interesting. Like the urge to express your self and profit motives and, or like having an agenda. It's like, my agenda is love and openness and patience and sensitivity. Um, 
and like teaching that, espousing that, being a, a gospeler of those things and like making those things cool, right? I would, I would probably like to have people watch less Netflix, you know, do less doom scrolling um, on the social media app of the day um, and certainly any cable TV news and write out your stream of consciousness and send it to your friends. Yeah, that would be nice. Like that would be the change I'd I'd I'd, I'd want to see. And it's like you make social media into something that it's not, it's not. Like essentially, like make it like therapy. So, right. Some so, some social media is kind of like that, but it ends up becoming. No, you know, it's always it's always uh, it's always it always ends up being a projection of what you what you want to show the world. Never mm. your therapeutic. Uh, yeah. Impression. Well, and it's like maybe I've just totally run through all of my scripts as far as like, I mean, what I want to show the world, right? It's like I've, I've kind of like exhausted like who I want to be, and now it's just what I am, and it's like, well, here I am, and it's like I'm not gonna like beat my chest, say like, ooh, look at me, because it's like. There's too many people doing that. No, nobody can care. And unfortunately, that's been a big theme of my writing lately is like, here I am. I am so in tune with the soul, the truth, the human condition, and nobody cares because nobody can care. Because why, like, I don't know, it's like... Yeah, why, why not? Well, people never learned how to care. Nobody's I, interested. I think that's... It's not... I think that people probably would be interested, but nobody has learned how to be interested in that. I don't know. That's the way I see it. Like, you know, you talk yeah, about... Yeah, the taste. You, you need talk to make a taste for it. Being, you know, the way we are raised... the ra- We are raised to be obedient mm. and to follow the rules and all that. We we aren't really taught to to... We aren't taught to understand that 100%. kind of stuff, really. And listen, no, yeah, we're, taught, we're taught to value the things that make money. I mean, unfortunately, yep. and that's kind of sad. Capitalism does not really make the best art. Ooh, I don't know about that. That's a that's a tough one. Mm. I, I would argue it does not. Well, I mean, me me being up against the the buzzsaw of needing to make a miracle happen every hour. And not being able to relax actually makes me makes the art very good. You think Cause so? It, yeah, because it needs to be right. Or because it's more painful. I mean, like, <laughs> I have to close the gap fast, right? Like, 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 I need to get out all the crap that I have to say that doesn't need to be heard rapidly. That's why I've like you know worked every single day on it. You know, I haven't I haven't taken a I mean, weekend or vacation are things that happened to me two lifetimes ago. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no day off. Right. But, you know, I mean, like. No, there's no day off. There's never there's never a day off. And if you if you are taking a day off, then you're taking a day off from not your art. You're taking a day off from some other thing that you're doing. I don't know. Yeah. What. uh, So right now. Jeff Lewis, you have a Patreon. I do. And what? How do? How do? How do people find you? How do? Like, um. What's the best way it, to follow you? Is it on Twitter? Is it on? Did we just go to Patreon? The best way to follow me. Um. How, how, if I if I, I think I might be your audience, how would I how would I become your audience? God damn, you know, <laughs> if this, yeah, um, my, my professional answer is not, well, you know, I, I'm going to bring, I mean, I'll, Substack is probably a better one than Patreon. Okay. So right now. Doing a Substack. That's cool. Um, but it's, I mean, I, I play with both, um, and Medium and Tumblr. And that's too many, and you know what? That's too many ands. I yeah. mean, 
Um, yeah, it's it's sort of hard to find me, but that's not true. That's not true at all. I'm there. Do you, um, do, you cu- do you curate this anywhere? Like your Patreon supporters, do they get everything? Like, do they get a, a feed of what you're doing? Um, hmm. You know what? I I mean, I I took a break from from Twitter in early June, and this is after a very solid six years of probably spending three hours a day on Twitter. Yeah, I was a um, follower of yours. Yeah. Um, so Twitter is an interesting medium because there, there you can get followers who are that. That's your direct line to to the people who is your audience. So that's one actually kind of really cool place to 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 be an artist, except that it comes with a lot of baggage. And um, but so but right now. Um, like Patreon is is how you're going to be making any money that you make off what you do. It's going to be people whoever is following no. for you. So my better answer to to how to become my audience is mm-hmm. have a relationship with me. I see. Right. I give. I've given more to you than I have. I think to my quote unquote audience in the last you know week. Um. Because in a sense, I don't, I don't have an audience. There is no grand mass of people following me. It's a bunch of individuals. And I think every individual f- who has a spot in their mind and heart and language and map of reality for me, it's different. And it's, it's personalized. Um, even though I could put all those, all like I, I could put all those people in in one place, um, and ideally, you know, in in heaven, and maybe in this lifetime, I I bring those people together and kind of do some leadership and community building amongst the people who read my stuff and who have a relationship with me, um. Yeah, well, that sounds like a different job. That sounds like community organizing, or it sounds like leadership, or even some kind of, you know, therapy, really. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, and there's a there's a, a dire need for that, I think. There's you know? a di- there is 100% a dire need for it. And it's like, I, I kind of have to chuckle and scoff whenever someone invites me to their thing because it's like well it all like i would love to go to the beach and do yoga and read these old religious texts and do journaling and do reflective stuff and be in community sounds great um where where does the money come from or how how do i get rescued from having to somehow get money from somewhere else to pay for housing and healthcare and cell phone and, and food. Well, how do you want, how do you want, uh, to get paid? Like, what do you want to get paid for? Yeah. I, I mean, essentially right now, you know, That's why this I goes to Patreon. the audience question. It's well, I mean, Patreon is, I mean, 10 bucks a month doesn't really do shit. Right. Okay. Um, it, 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 it's, it's negligible. Now, if I was mainstream enough, you know, brain pickings is a great example. Maria Popova, I've seen her on stage several times. I've, I've read a lot of her stuff and I've dug deep into her material. It's very good. It serves thousands of people. Um, mine does not because mine is my own journey of my own psychology. And um, it, it could become popular. Um, you know, I don't mind going mainstream. I think I'd be ready for it. You know, I, I mean, do you Whatever know Jordan? That means. Hmm? Whatever that means. Going well, mainstream. I mean, mainstream I think... just means enough people like what you're doing, really. Right. right. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, if I, well, yeah. It, it meant something more before the internet disrupted the, sure. uh, the, there used to be, there used to be a professional world of art curation that got, that is slowly being destroyed or quickly being destroyed at, uh, that now, n- now, now mainstream just means a lot of people like what you do. But I'll tell you this, Jeff. So one of the reasons that I like to keep in touch with you is because you you help me in the in and how I think about what I do. So mm-hmm. um, just just reading reading your stuff and listening to you makes me think. Uh, like even in this conversation, I think, oh yeah, sometimes. I don't know how to write a song. I, it's just not coming to me. Why is that? And it's like, well, obviously, I'm not, I'm not feeling enough pain, or I'm not feeling enough. Mm. Emotion. It's because I'm trying to design the song. I'm not trying to art it. Mm. And, uh, and like those things, I, I mean, are, all artists need that. They need that um, sermon, I guess. Yeah, so that's, that's really valuable. Yeah. Well, funny, I, I today was uh, digging into excerpts from Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way. Um, and yeah, I mean, she's kind of nailed the formula as well, you know, both with the morning pages where you write, she suggests three longhand pages written every morning about whatever, just to kind of get the thought and word making machinery going. And you might be surprised what gets what gets swept up, and you know how much journal you really have to say, um, and what you really do think about the things that you think about. Mm-hmm. You know, if you spend half an hour or forty minutes just with your thoughts and get them down on paper, which gives them a seriousness and a heaviness, and it's a labor to get them out. You start to choose every word of your thoughts a lot more carefully because you see how much it costs. Because you got to write it down. It's like, well, I can't afford a stupid, you know, that yeah. in there. And so you start to throw out and not use the stuff because you don't want to have to write it. Yeah, I see. Oh, well, that's good exercise then. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, yeah. I mean, as far as writing more, better songs, it's like, well, it turns out that you write a lot better stuff and more stuff comes when you're writing all day. And that's essentially what I do is like, I, I sit and I write all, I sit with my keyboard all day and sit and, and I watch my mind all day and I pop, you know, I sit at my screen and I mean, really I, I curate a fireworks show of thought and meaning and feeling and intrigue for myself across, you know, using my notes and books and conversations and links and all this stuff. And I, I kind of like go get lost in yeah, meaning and feeling and interesting l- scrolling through my old work and writing down new stuff. And um, I write the best stuff when I'm happy. Hmm. I know it's weird. That's huh? a, that's, I feel like that's rare. Most people say happiness writes white. I I know. Uh, well, I mean, I don't care what it writes, but I I I am the most satisfied when I mean it's not. I just write more. I'm like the. It's not about writing white or or whatever. It's not ri- writing. I don't even know if I write my best. I I write the most. I do the most arting. I'm most in mm. my head, and I'm just ready to go. If mm. I'm in a great mood, I can just write all day long. If I'm if I'm feeling pain, it's really hard for me to get something out. Sometimes it's huh. good. Sometimes it's good when I'm feeling that, but it's not usually what gives me the energy and momentum to do it. Um, yeah, That's... it's weird. And if if I am feeling happy, I can still write. I mean, I will still write stuff that is pretty sad. I mean, stuff mm. that comes from a sad place in me, but I am ultimately happy. And I think that's, that's a, and I don't know if you get this as a writer, but if I write something and I say I record it and I sit back and I listen to it and I like what I've done, I mean, it's like a rush of energy. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, that, I love this. All right. Ready to go. Next, next, next chorus, Mm -hmm. next verse, next line. But does that happen as a writer? Do you read the last sentence you wrote and you're like, oh, right. This is good. I'm I'm ready for the Well, 
Yeah, I mean, because it's like that's when those two selves are in sync, right? Like, like there's that one who is the the unstoppable, indefatigable, which is a, a word I like, genius who has the arrogance to insist on his own vision and will do it no matter what. And then there's the other person you are, which is the reader with impeccable taste, lean back, looking at the whole world, looking at all of time. And it's like, well, if a New Yorker article is really going to get me, it's got to beat out Bach and Beethoven and all the books on the shelf. It's really got to be really, really good and really get me. And it's like when both of those are in sync, when you doing your refusal and your insistence and your stubbornness and putting down what is rushing through you and won't be denied when that also speaks and gets the attention and admiration of the reader self that's when the artist is in accord and it's like that's when you're really cooking and then it's like that's that's flow at a very profound level if you like microscopically and like look at the whole thing like a physics and chemistry thing it's like that's when when your life is really cooking at as many degrees as it can yeah i don't i feel like it's very hard for me to get in flow if i'm if i'm feeling pain so the the writing might happen it might be good but it's not gonna it's not yeah it's maybe it's another thing too where i myself like i'm not afraid to write really bad terrible stuff Mm -hmm. to me me, like that's fine i'll write it i don't believe that any idea is a bad idea until you try it and i don't even agree with that what i just said but i (laughs) think myself anyway Mm -hmm. well that's exactly that process it's like you got to keep going through a large volume of stuff that you need to say but you know isn't the final thing but to get to saying the thing that's going to be the final thing you need to say 27 stupid things that aren't the final thing and when it, especially when it comes to music, and I'm sure it's like this with writing too, but if I write something that is, is really dumb, it's really easy for me to change that into something that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very easy for me to do that. And that's like a little Rubik's Cube game, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, music is... That's where I mean, craft, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I write in a very small box. So I keep a very... I mean, it's probably... Two and a half inches wide. Wait, what do you? Um, mean? Well, yeah, what does that mean? Are you so figuratively? No, I'm actually speaking literally. Like on, like on my on my desktop, on my laptop. Mm-hmm. Um, I write a lot of, of of what I write in a sticky note in the top left corner of the desktop. That's where I that's where I write all my like new thoughts really? as they come. In a sticky note. And then do you transcribe them somewhere else then? And then I, I copy paste those and I add those into the notes app, which then I'll go full screen with that and spread it out. Mm-hmm. Um, now, sometimes I do write directly into the notes app, but it's different. I mean, but like, like the medium is like sort of different. Like I often write thoughts in about the span of like one or two measures to uh, to a composer so i'm i'm kind of knowledgeable with with music i i played the alto sax from fourth grade all through high school um and you stopped i i was 18 i i did send in an, an an audition cassette tape for the ucla marching band alto. but i didn't alto yeah. that's uh that's that that's not Kenny G. That's uh, that's a right. set. But, Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Alto, Charlie Parker. Right. Um. Yeah. Cool. Um. I didn't know that. Yeah, but I mean, like, yeah, like I was eighteen, nineteen. I mean, it essentially got to the point where it's like, well, to to level up, you need to um really learn music theory, really study, really like really understand the mechanics of what music is rather than just like playing the notes correctly, which I was very good at. Yeah. Um, well, there's, I mean, there's lots of different ways to, to make music and play it, but yeah, if you're talking about learning to play an instrument in the traditional way, then yeah, you got to level up in that, in that way. I went to music school, so I, I leveled up 
But I also realized that afterwards, leveling up is kind of a myth. I mean, if you really enjoy making music, you will figure out any way to do it. Right. But if you're looking at it as like a technical craft, then you do have to figure out how to take it to the next level. Yeah. I mean, to me, playing saxophone well was almost like doing math well. I mean, like I had no sense of like play of like art as something you do to express your sorrow or to like work out your personal feelings. Yeah. It was never, it was never about that they, when I they, was a kid. They don't teach that. And they don't teach that. Right. It's like, and it's too bad. Like, why don't they teach kids to yeah. love their musical instruments? Like, no, this is yeah. the black button. This is how you play every note. Now, this is how you make it sing. You know, this is how you, yeah. this is why like, you play the notes. Like <laughs> teaching the saxophone as a place to go, like as a friend. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't get any of that. So I actually had a music theory teacher in college who, who when he would play chords, he was teaching music theory, so he'd play chords and he'd make a, make a funny face. He would make like the face that goes along with the chord. Mm -hmm. And I remember asking him, like, you have to make the face? He said, and he's this, he's this <laughs> Italian guy. He said, yes, you have to make the face. Like, you, ha you, have, to, <laughs> you have to show the emotion of the chord because that that's what you're feeling. Hmm. And if you if you're not feeling this when you're making the music, then music is just a, it's just math for you. It's not yeah. actually an expression of emotion. And I wish they taught that music is a communication of emotion from the beginning. Yeah, that's hmm. a shame. Well, it's hard to understand emotions when you're when you're a kid. Well, you the, can teach somebody to play something and say, "Do you hear how this sounds sad?" Do you hear how this sounds happy? Mm -hmm. I, I think I could teach a yeah. person to, to do that, but I don't know. Maybe it is very hard. Maybe when you're trying to teach kids to be able to play at recitals, then you kind of just need them to follow the dots. I mean, yeah, it's like you're, you're, you're making me think back on, it's like, why didn't we talk about emotions? Why did, why did it take, <laughs> why did it take being fucking miserable myself firsthand when I'm 26 mm -hmm. and 24 yeah being Ooh. miserable it's like why couldn't you have taught me it when i was fucking 12 yeah. and 15 when i was going through the awful shit and it's like yeah yeah hopefully the kids are getting a better education now i think I they mean, are that's, that's something you're supposed to learn from your parents though right <laughs> <laughs> if, as well see parents don't take kids seriously which is too bad i mean at least in my generation they didn't like the, no, the the parents were yeah they didn't share jack shit with their kids i mean i still go through it with my dad it's like can you treat me like a peer like be sad be yeah. mad like let's talk about being a man and a person and how weird it is like don't don't hide the hard stuff and yeah. put on some performance like i don't need your performance of parenthood yeah, and actually, you doing that just holds us both back. Yeah, that's a uh, kids. Uh, I know for when I was young too. Uh, my my parents were usually pretty good at at communicating emotion, but kids were we still didn't have valid. Our, our emotions were not validated. They were invalidated. You know, we were called a brat if we if we didn't agree. Yeah, so, you know, it's not like we have very strong feelings about something. It's like your, your feelings are wrong. And that's just something that it took us a long time to learn. Mm -hmm. that you can't tell somebody that they have the wrong feelings. That's, mm. that's fucks them up. Yeah. And it probably, and it probably wasn't that they were wrong. It was that it was the wrong time for them. It was like, yeah, of course your feelings were too big and they were in the way. Right yeah, now, no such thing as wrong feelings, really. Right. I, I mean, mean, I mean, just, I mean, like, they're just like bad timing and it's inconvenient, right? We can talk about children's feelings versus capitalism, right? You spend all day looking at spreadsheets, thinking about the value of time and interest rates and money and time. And then you come home and you see a children, like a child crying. It's like, Jesus, like, <laughs> yeah. Like, like, I can accept that you need to be heard for this, but it's like, well, that's that's time spent but it it fucks up the your 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 time value of of money I, yeah dude i mean the whole thing of like measuring life is such a mind fuck and then of course it's like 
you both want to make make this into content but it's also like well i'm also gonna not make it content just yet i want to delve deeper and see what we have to say about like you know i mean aren't i theoretically trying to invite my audience along the the thought loop-de-loops that i that i do theoretically yes Right, we got really interesting places in this in this conversation. This is more interesting than anything I've ever written, at least in a while. I feel like, and it's like, whoa, if we could actually like work out what we're actually trying to say here and actually saying, it's actually really interesting. And yeah. I haven't really, and then, I haven't really read it elsewhere. If you, yeah, uh, and then if if people could talk to children this way, that would be pretty incredible. Or at least, at least no. tell them that tell. Them, I don't know. The idea of telling a child that their feelings are valid just seems like. Well, yeah, and like letting them letting them explore, right? Like, but I'm and it's like that's a conversation, right? Yeah. Con- conversation between parents and children seems like the most untapped big blue sky opportunity that there is. Um, For sure. Well, yeah. But in the absence of having the money to have children, I go and try to have an audience. And I essentially <laughs> try to, to parent these, these people. Um, and it's no wonder they unsubscribe. Because I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty tough father. Um, You're a tough father. I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty demanding. I'm saying work 15 hours a day. Never take weekends and vacations because you need to learn your voice. And they're like, no, I want something easier. And it's like, yeah. well, there it is. Um, so, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I may end up not really moving forward past where I am well, in, I like my, in my life and my work. Because it's like, well, what I demand is too hard. And not only does, not only does no one want to play long, but they don't want to pay for it. Well, I don't think, like, well, I think people don't, don't know what to pay for. Like, what are you asking yeah. people to pay for? Well, I, and, and I guess it's a, it's a relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, You've, yeah. You told me before that, that um, your service that you offer is to kind of share consciousness with somebody. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely a mind meld. Right. And it's okay. like, you like, like, to me, this I'm, is this is very different than than you being paid as an artist. I mean, it's hmm. it's a little bit different, but like you're talking about, yeah, uh, kind of sharing your headspace with somebody else. Yeah. And is this where you? This is where you become a parent of sorts, or? Hmm. Or is that different? That's different. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Or is this where you just become a kind of a thought partner? Definitely a thought partner, right? Now, ideally and theoretically, I think this time here merged with me is worth several hundred dollars per hour, maybe more. But what, what, what are you offering to help people figure out? Um, or is that not do you, your equation? Oh, then no. I'm, I'm, well, I mean, even you told me a few minutes ago that talking to me and hearing from me, you know, both, you know, you watching my, my endless attempt to, you know, tempt an audience in public as I, you know, when I use yeah. social media and talk to the audience that's not yet there and see if any human being actually shows up, you know, watching me do that flailing and, you know, our own one-on-one correspondence that I have, sort of like backstage of of that performance, right? There's sure. this notion of like on stage and backstage. Yeah. Um, um, we all have a backstage with us going mm-hmm. on all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, like you told me, it's like I help you figure out how to think about what you're doing in your work. Yeah, that seems like a very valuable thing to a lot of people. 
Yeah. I mean, I know, maybe not everyone, but some people, I think. Yeah. I mean, have, having someone to not just bounce ideas off, but actually very personal thoughts. Yeah. And also someone who it's like the, the value grows with time. Right. I mean, I know I'm going to have stuff to say to you tomorrow and it's going to like, we've honed a context here by every little word that we've said, we've like honed the space. Right. That I mean, sounds like, like a, yeah, that sounds like a hard, I don't mean to interrupt, but that sounds like a hard, um, that sounds like a very, does it ever get high risk? I mean, like, do you ever fear that you're going to like, how do you do dance around somebody else's thoughts and feelings and emotions? Like, well, it's pretty delicate, I would imagine. It is very delicate. Now, I think I have this intuitive flexibility. You might even call it self-reflexibility, um, which is a term we can look up and discuss <laughs> later because it's, it's complicated. It's kind of that like simultaneous awareness of like being both the artist and the audience. Um. But essentially, like, I know that you are the self as well. Mm-hmm. You are the self that I am, too, and that we really are the same. And so, in a sense, it's like me talking to you and, and you talking back to me. It's sort of the same conversation I have in my writing. Like, me writing when I'm alone is the same thing as two people talking. Yeah, I see. I see what you're what you're saying. Like uh, when you're writing, you are sharing your consciousness with yourself. Yes, I mean it's it's probably honestly a a conversation between those two people, between the artist and the the reader that I am, and essentially it's like the reader that I am who also like sees me and my you know metrics and brand and bank account and the fact that I'm not being talked about. It's like, I'm trying to talk to my inner artist and say, yo, like, please, like, please, like, let me show you this world that you're living in. So you can do something that does something like, let, let me bring you back to earth. And that artist is, you know, off in, in childhood memory or reading stuff from five years ago, or thinking about Beethoven or thinking about this other stuff that's nice and it's like well if i was rich and like someone paid me 100k to do whatever i want i could do and it would be great but it's like nah like you have to somehow translate the artist to the audience and it's like in a sense it's like a very difficult meeting that's occurring between those two voices and like it should be difficult and it is Right. I mean, it's as hard as the fucking climate talks. It's why there's not peace in the Middle East. It's because like you can talk and talk and talk and it's actually really hard. And there's two very entrenched personalities and two, two different models of what a good life is and what is worth doing. <sighs> well, I, don't, I don't think people really talk enough. I, I, I agree. I, I I think that you could probably solve a lot more problems if people did what we're doing right now. Uh Uh-huh. And it's like, like this again is like the artist versus versus editor thing. Um, It's like you either show up to a meeting between people, say a work meeting, and you're driving the agenda because you have a vision and you know that people need to be pushed to do things. And people, people will only do what they are afraid of leaving undone. So you're either that driver who hmm. knows how to drive or you're someone who's, who's, in that, who's in that meeting trying to avoid responsibility and you're just taking notes and you're not really injecting either personality or vision or opinion or a set of standards. You're just kind of there. It's your day job. That's the most fucking dangerous thing on the earth. It's a nuclear threat is the day job. People who are there to perform the script that helps them not get fired so they can leave. That is the most dangerous nuclear weapon on the face of the earth right now. The Wait, day job. Explain how, who is that? 
Explain why that's a weapon. I explain that metaphor. Um, who is wielding that weapon? I guess my question is like you're talking about the 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 employee or whoever is. It's more like a. Uh, it it's the fact that people ha- people go to jobs because they have to. Yeah, I understand that. I, I to me, it's like. Um, like that's just a way of saying that it's a very dangerous place to be. It's an unhealthy place. It's not. Yeah. I mean, it would be better if everybody an, could do something that they love, but that we know that that's really not, not most, most people don't have that choice though, you know? Um, well, yeah. I mean, ha, it's a funny thing about choice. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the podcast that I started our phone call tonight talking about with this guy who is a thought leader and, you know, started this nonprofit center at this university and he's in the spotlight and all the, you know, he's successful. Um, (laughs) He's done all the things he's successful. And now he's fucking exhausted and has no time for himself, you know, and he has to talk his book every moment of the day. Um, And the work is not done. Right. It's, you know, racial justice. Um, the work's never done. Um, and he just like sounds very, very tired as he should be because it is tiring. Um, I was going day jobs. Well, I, we were talking about like, Oh, okay, he, yeah. He, yep, he, yep. So, so he, he was asked about what, like, he talked about power and choice. No, power and freedom. Mm-hmm. And he says that power comes before freedom and that freedom is the freedom to make a choice. You know, say you're choosing what sneakers to buy. It's like, well, you need to, ha- like, you only have that freedom of choice because you're free, right? Like, if you were under military power mm-hmm. in a concentration camp. It's like, you don't get to choose right. what, what to do. You know, he said that power is the ability to, to create choices. I see. Yes. That which is. I think is very, very interesting. Um, now, yeah, there's nothing more violent than a made up mind. Um, cause a, a human being is a very destructive thing, I think. Yeah. Um, very able to not think about consequences and just do the small thing it has to do in front of it to check a box. Right. So, so people who don't think they have a choice, that's a dangerous thing. Cause. Yeah. Well, I, I think that some people, I guess it's not that some people don't have a choice. It's that some people's options are, are fewer and you know that's that's just unfortunately the way the world is right now and we're trying to change that i think yeah yeah um yeah the thing about choices and it's like i i face this every day right in the you know the despair of me being out of money it's like well it i i have to create the choices for myself i have to see options that aren't that aren't apparent. And I think this is a big thing about art, right? I mean, like this is the hardest art there is, is finding a way to get money to keep doing what you want and not giving up. That's the (laughs) arting. That's actually probably the arting at the center of all art. Um, And I'm going to quote the painter, Georgia O'Keeffe. And she says that don't worry about success. Success doesn't exist. All that matters is making your unknown known and keeping the unknown always beyond you. I'll say it again because it's a really important thing. Which is that don't worry about success. There is none. All that there is is making your unknown known. And keeping the unknown always beyond you. Making the unknown, making your unknown known and keeping the unknown beyond you. Yeah. So it's like always being at that edge of 
I'm going to quote a poet, Arthur Rimbaud, who wrote a letter to one of his contemporaries, contemporaries when he was in some sort of trouble. He says, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this, but I will. Hmm. What, I, those, what do those quotations have to do with one another? Well, I think you have to... Everyone always is facing a moment of doing this or that. Doing the thing you thought you were going to do or had to do, or you do something else. Yeah. Um, you need to give yourself options. You need to see that you have choices. You, you can respond a variety of ways, and it's not just if this, then that. You don't have to do it the same as yesterday. You don't have to do what's expected of you. I think what's expect. I think that that thing right there is like when things are expected of you that you don't want to do, but you do anyway to appease the system. That there is the poison, and 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 that that there is the thing you always got like you you know when your life gets fucked up, you got to trace it back. You got to go back to where you broke off from the from the path of integrity and where you betrayed your heart and your better sensibility and you obeyed something else for some other outcome. That's the thing you'll end up having to retreat back to and the, the, the break to repair. And then you got to go back and take the right road. I see. Yeah. Um, very profound. So yeah, we're, we're always at that edge um, of, of having to choose, you know, and it's like, that's the trap in a sense I've set myself, right? Like if you asked me six, 12, 18 months ago, certainly two, three, four years ago, I would be very overzealous and self-righteous about following my passion and my intuition and my inner genius. Now I have, and I'm almost 34, which isn't old, um, but it's a lot harder to be to be easily enthusiastic about what I'm doing because... And why is that? Well, I guess your peers get older. Um, I don't know. I mean, We're it's so a lazy... We're so influenced by our peers, aren't we? One way or another, for better well, or worse. Yeah. I mean, I'm about as singular of a human being as you can get, I think, guys, since I've pretty much like eliminated what many call their real life. And I really just dedicated <laughs> it to art and work. And I would say about only about 20 or 15% of my life is actually my real life. Um, the other times I'm kind of the life of the mind and that's what most of my life is. Um, but yeah, I, I say all that to say it's like, well, now it's like, well, I've made my bed and now I sleep in it. And um, yeah, my my peers, what, own houses, get married, have kids, pay their bills, play it safe, get their career, keep it together, teach, you know, teach their kids how to do what their parents taught them to do. And you have a nice you, Instagram account with some nice family pictures. And do you feel pressure then? I mean, do you do you do you feel like you need to have those same things because you see it? Um, do you I don't. Are you good at dealing with that? Or are you? Not I am. Good? Yeah. A lot of people are really bad at dealing with that. Yeah. They see, I they mean, see, they see their peers that have their quote unquote lives together, and they think, "Oh shit." I'm still doing this other thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a very common thing for animals and social animals like we are. And it's like, I'm not ashamed that I'm not entirely over that. But I'll also say that I'm quite over that because I also know that all those that like their lives suck just like mine does. They've got yeah. their highs and lows. We have very different tastes for meaningful things, right? I mean, this girl I loved, who's now married to somebody else, who I loved for a long time. You know, I checked in with her the other day, and she sent me a picture from her bed, and she's 
sitting there with, you know, two, two cats and a dog and mm -hmm. he's, he's next to her and they're, you know, reading her nephew children's books uh -huh. and it's like perfect Sunday yeah. morning. Well, I mean, that's what it looks like in the picture. Well, but I mean, what, 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 uh, what, what, one thing that we always have to remember, especially being artists, is that everybody lives their own life, right? And you don't get to live anybody else's life and they don't get to live yours. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful because fuck, fuck everyone else's lives, however beautiful or perfect or, <laughs> or shitty they are. It's still a life. Lucky. Yeah. I mean, uh, when, when I'm a little older than you, when I was your age, I didn't have nearly the grasp on my art as you have on yours right now. Mm. So I would have been jealous of you as my peer <laughs> at that time. Right. I, and I also, mm -hmm. I mean, and I also didn't have those things that we consider perfect. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't married with kids and a dog and a cat and all that stuff. Um, I, I, and I also knew that I didn't really care or want those things. I, I actually didn't. Mm -hmm. And, and I was looking for something else. At least those, that's what I told myself at the time. Mm -hmm. And thank God I did because otherwise it's really easy to see my, my peers, my friends, my, my, my old art mates, my old band mm -hmm. and music music partners mm. were all, uh, you know, scoring Disney films and buying houses when I was living in the same dump and trying to write a good song. Mm. So those things are really, really kind of toxic for artists, I think. Those thoughts of, I don't have what other people have, even though we're technically supposed to be yeah. the same thing. And we're supposed to be peers and we're supposed to influence each other. Well, I mean, I, I know that having a wife and, you know, having to go do my Disney email and projects tomorrow, that's no fucking salvation at all. <laughs> it's for, really not. For consciousness uh, let me and just, being a person. I'm going to put this into real life for a second. So mm -hmm. my, my old band, bandmates, I won't say his name, but... Um, he actually, he's, he, he writes for a, a Disney show. He's a music composer. I swear he hates his life. I mean, he hates yeah. his job. I mean, every single day he's working for like 10 hours writing music. And he loves the music that he's doing. And he loves the praise that he gets. And he loves the fans. Mm -hmm. and he loves mm -hmm. the money that he makes. But he is really tired of doing it because it's so formulaic and so, so... I don't even think he makes it generic because he makes the music really good, but I think that day after day doing the same thing and not really getting a whole lot, it's kind of a thankless job in the moment. You know, it's not like you're going to have a, you're not, it's not like you're going to have, what is your assistant going to say? Oh my God, this is amazing. You're a genius. Right, right, No, it's right. somebody going, oh, it's okay. Maybe make this a little bit louder and then it'll work. That's the best, that's the most feedback that you're going to get or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just an example of how that is when the grass is always greener. Yeah, but like, yeah, but just because the grass is greener doesn't mean it's not shitty grass, I guess. That's right. The, that's the only, that's the best metaphor I can come up with right now. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good example. Yeah. Um, just because the grass is greener doesn't mean there isn't dog shit in it or something like yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, grass is grass right and like there's nobody on earth i mean we i mean like beyonce would be someone it's like you know who who's the the very pinnacle of whatever it is i mean lead singer of of whatever it's like well you still gotta wake up and be in america you still gotta wake up and be in a body you still gotta <laughs> wake up and have your potential i mean Lin Manuel Miranda. I mean, you're a genius. It's like it's like, well, you know, two years ago is two years ago. It's like, what are you doing now? And it's like, how do you sustain it? And how yeah. do you? And especially waking up in America. I mean, the, the, the fucking all of us are failures in so many ways because yeah, because cops are still killing black people. I mean, we're, right. we're all fucking uh, <laughs> well. Failures. 
and and so like that's 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 you know you're right like like waking up in a body is still something that you have to deal with yeah um i think the you know my parents generation they didn't have social media they they didn't feel the solidarity and like the i'll call it one fleshness um with people who were suffering, right? They were shielded from that. They went to the right schools. They went to the right companies. They went to parties with their friends. You know, they might read the newspaper and, you know, talk about the war. Mm -hmm. When there's a war, they would talk about it, but they would try to not talk about it, right? Just like we, just like we try to avoid the news. You know, I try to avoid the news. They try to avoid the news and talk about pleasant things, you know, and they bought Ford, cars and they got new wallpaper and they went on vacations and like i mean they they ignored social injustice because it's too hard it's too messy yeah um you don't it's it's not fun can't teach your kids about it back then because you want your kids to be kids or whatever well you also want them to be like rich and white and successful yeah that's that's something yeah so so yeah i think you're right i think our parents generation uh, had an easy opt out from, yeah. from the revolution. And we don't have that. Because, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we don't have that. And thank God we don't have it because right. we don't, I mean, that's not, that's, that's taking the blue pill, right? Or the red mm-hmm. pill. I forget mm-hmm. which pill it is, but, um, it's taking the pill. <laughs> that's taking the wrong pill right now. That's not the pill that we should be taking. Right. Um, so in that way, social media is, a very good and disruptive thing. Um, that's the best word that we can use to describe it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I right. mean, it shakes you awake, and it, it shows you how how bad things really are. Um, you definitely can't avoid it like our parents' generation could. Right, right. Um, and even if they didn't, even if they didn't avoid it, and even if they didn't ignore it. There is still a, you know, when I told, I, I, my, on my birthday this year, I went to the, the protest in San Francisco. Mm. I told my, my mother about it. You know, I'm white. I come from a white family. My mother, her first thing out of her mouth wasn't happy birthday or, oh, that's great. Uh, it was, how did you do that and stay, stay safe? <laughs> I went mm. dur- during during this pandemic, and I it was so like you know it was that moment where I realized that she is from that generation where she could choose to ignore something like that, and even though even though my mom is she is she supports the movement of course that everyone does but even she was even um you know she even su- the supported the civil rights movement in the sixties, but she still kind of had this she had this belief that you know there's not much that we can do as well yeah you know there's not much that you can do you can't be the savior (laughs) and like well mm -hmm. and she's she might be right about that but that's that to me was kind of an infuriating thing to say to somebody Mm -hmm. who really wants to help make a difference Uh, well yeah i mean it goes exactly back to that thing about having options and it's like well if you want to not have a choice, you can say that you don't. Or you can sit in silence and think about it again for another two seconds. And all of a sudden, boom, there is another way to make a difference, right? It's that same, you know, making the unknown known, right? Like, like you can either choose to say things are stuck the way they are and that's the way it is. I'm going to go do something else like check fucking Instagram or go on Netflix or go eat some chocolate or something which you know all have their place but they have to you gotta have yeah you gotta use the tool at the right time um yeah well hey i want to talk about i want to talk about one more thing before we wrap this up i do want to talk about sleep okay Uh, because i don't really know how to deal with sleep in my life lately and I'm trying hmm. to figure it out. And I wanted to figure out a healthy way that actually works with being an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, for the last probably 10 years of my life, I have I, ha- I felt like I have forgotten how to sleep properly. 
hmm. um, because and a lot of it has to do with uh, the, the constant and infinite amount of content that we have. Hmm. I, I'm always reading. In fact, I will usually try to read myself to sleep, which I don't think is a good idea because my mind gets very active when I'm reading. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering what you do and what your sleep patterns are like and your schedule is like and stuff like that. Yeah. That work for you. Yeah. Well, and this kind of dredges up a bit of the conversation about you you like writing when you're happy, but mm-hmm. you, can, you can't write when you're in pain. Um, I mean, my my whole creative output sort of hinges on my like daily health and like brain health and mental state and sort of like you know eating the same thing for breakfast and sitting in the same place and kind of like working on this like same schedule um i mean sleep yeah i mean i've been using my phone less um i'll like go out for walks without my phone i'll be without it for hours which is great oh really? um, you do oh we should talk about that next time yeah um yeah i mean Going i mean phoneless yeah part of quitting twitter was just like what if i just how are you lived, gonna find your way home lived my life and just like looked at the world mm-hmm. and that i think has made a huge difference um but yeah back to to sleep i mean it's a sacred thing well so um, so when you're when you're ready to go to sleep you do you turn off your phone do you set set it by the bed and turn it on silent do you put it on do not disturb and so do you, go, do you go to sleep at the same time every night about okay so i'll i'll kind of do this one at a time so i mean i've 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 had <laughs> i've had my phone on do not disturb since 2013 oh okay um i've in the last year or two, I've started sleeping with a phone in another room because I sort of feel like the the fact that it connects to the internet is like creates a bit of like a like a force field or there's like there's like wavelengths going in and out that I think are like my body is sensitive to right like and like this may be totally all projection and not true on a on a physics reality level, but I, I feel like there's a, like my phone feels different on my person when it's on airplane mode versus not. And like, like, like when it's got the potential energy of store, it's like connected to all the stuff that it is. Yeah. Okay. So I've, I've put that out of my room for a while. And like, I've also just like, like trust that like, well, I will deal with it as best I can during my best hours, but it's like, I've only got some, some good hours. And it's like, there's always a ton of disaster there as much as I can bear. Um, so I, yeah, I, I mean, I haven't really been like reading stuff on the phone. Oh, that's good. Um, I need to stop doing that. I think just cause I, you know, and it, you know, um, Writer Dave Perel, who I like and don't like, um, he sort of reminded me. It's like, well, so so much of the stuff people read was written in the last t- twenty four hours, and it's like, oh man, like that's actually not that good at all. Like, there's all <laughs> sorts. I mean, there's a full. Tw- I mean, you and I both know. No, there's a full Twitter feed every day. You know, I used to literally spend two, three, two to three hours a day reading through it all and reading through the conversations, which I think was a great education that I got. Mm -hmm. But I think now it's like, now I know that that will be there every day. And I both get to choose and have to choose Mm -hmm. my participation. And it's like, how am I going to allow, how am I going to relate to that always on bandwidth and rhythm of all the talk going on today of all the people that I know in the world. And it's always right there. And I can like tune into that river as as much as I want and like make that my inner voice as much as I want. Or I can kind of create my own inner voice. That is for me, I think. So I, 
the way I've discovered that for myself, and I think we've talked about this, is that I've stopped reading Twitter through the majority of the day. So I'll take a look at it in the morning and I'll take a look at it in the evening. But I miss the boredom that I that I have mm-hmm. with social media. So I want to cultivate that boredom so that because otherwise I'm not I'm not creating anything. Otherwise I'm just consuming and I get yeah. I don't have I don't have any original thoughts if I'm constantly reading other people's thoughts. Mm-hmm. Now, if I'm listening to if I'm listening to music, then I'll have lots of thoughts that are that are that come to me. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> um, I will the have. Water. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, I, I'll I'll take inspiration from things that I listen to, but when I'm reading, especially when it's just this constant barrage of of text. And when it's not even, I guess maybe because when it's not curated in a way that is, mm. you know, it's just Twitter. It's pretty random. I think it probably is. There's an algorithm to it, but other, it's to me, it's very random. So I, I had to stop doing that. But yeah, if if I if I do try to do that when I'm if I try to read Twitter when I'm trying to sleep, I will not sleep. Mm-hmm. So I, but I do know a lot of people use Twitter in bed. I, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've done it quite a lot, right? I mean, like, I think I'm I'm at what, 40,000 tweets, 45,000 tweets. Like, well, I mean, that was my life. That was my life. Wow. From, I mean, that's a lot of tweets. Certainly 2013. That's to that's, That's many. Very recent. How many per day is that? Wow. That's a lot. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, because I mean, I, you know, just like this talking I can do here, it's like, I essentially can write this fast. Essentially, I wanted to share, right? Like I wanted to be to be to be stimulated at this kind of speed. And also be sharing that and making that an invitation. Right? I mean, essentially, like, I would use Twitter as a as a way to make my inner voice concrete. I see. Yeah. Um, For me, it's a creative dumping ground, really. Yeah. Um, So I used it in a particular way. And like, you know, there's all sorts of tweet storms I've written in the last, you know, three to five years. um, Of, yeah, just like passionate bursts of things to say. Yeah. well, are you so, going to be coming back soon? Yeah, I know you took a break for a while. Well, I yeah, so I I kind of like came back about a week ago. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm doing a I'm doing a, doing a interview back for, for yeah, or, or I'm doing a bit more. I mean, tiny bits of like reading the feed, you know, and I I did the same on Instagram as well, and same on LinkedIn as well, and it, it's. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really sensitive to it now. Like I think I, 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 I unplugged and I sort of remembered, and I came back to life outside of living in other people's voices, and now I'm kind of coming back to it and like testing the waters, and it's like, damn, this is a strong drug. I mean, it's almost like like going off of like sugar or salt and, and going to like back to a very basic diet. And then you go and have like a restaurant pork chop slathered in butter. And it's like, Whoa, yeah, this is really intense. And it's like, <laughs> and like, I'm not even sure it's like good. Right. Cause like, <laughs> I mean like I'm so in touch with my own mind and how I need to like solve it and like turn my solving it into performance art and put that out as me and like be that. And like, I'm very consumed in my failure to do that. My thinking about the futility of that, my having to overcome the futility, even if it is futile, even if it is leading me into a brick wall, I need to write about the brick wall and find a way around it and make it not matter. And it's like, I'm very consumed in that. And then when I see someone else tweeting, it's like, oh, and like hundreds of other people are also going through their own version of that. And I can watch yeah. that. It's like, that's, it's like, whoa, like, 
what is the like yeah so it totally like it, it like it hijacks my priorities yeah. um and i'm yeah. not saying that reading yours or some other certainly writers right this is why i stay away from writers and i never ever ever wanted to go to a master's program never ever 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 would dream <laughs> of hanging out at bars with writers because they're a disaster it's like i know i'm a disaster yeah. i i am an emergency that i need to attend to all day and it's yeah. like i don't want your mess i know it's a mess i know you're just as fucking crazy as, crazy as i am it's poison yeah all right well probably finish this up this has been an awesome con conversation i have learned a lot talking to you jeff cool dude yeah um wow yeah you you sparked more than i would ever have written tomorrow on so my own here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna send you this recording okay and if you if you want to you can listen to it i don't know i'll probably play it back at some point yeah. i'm not gonna edit it or anything okay I'm going to, I'm going to, if, if you don't want to listen to it, you don't have to, mm -hmm. um, but I want us to make a decision on what we're going to do with it. We can publish this as it is mm -hmm. and we can give it to other people to listen to. We can publish it and not give it to other people to listen to and just kind of keep doing this. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think that, I think that people will want to listen to this. So, okay. um, so if, if you're listening to this and you're not me or Jeff, Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for listening. So, <laughs> so appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. And I, I feel fine having this be, be public and attached to me forever. I felt very good about it. And, okay. Great. Um, yeah. I'm not sure exactly what forum we're going to uh, do this in, but um, yeah. All right. Cool. Well, I guess that's it for tonight then. JJ, thank you so much for having me and for suggesting this. I'm so glad we met. I'm grateful for Michael Finney for bringing us together in the Art Cycle yeah. group. Um, Another uh, community organizer in the yeah. art space. So yeah. We'll have to talk to him sometime, too. Yeah. All right, everybody. Good night. Good night. Now, uh, Jeff, hold on for a second. Yep. I'm going to press stop recording, and then you're going to lose connection for a second, but just stay there. It's going to upload this recording. So just stay. stay okay. Stay.